Well, thank you all for joining me tonight. Um, so um, as Brooke said, um, I am the author of the design guidelines for the Vieux Carré as well as for the HGLC. So I've had a long love affair with the city of New Orleans and I consider it my second home. And some several of the people who I saw online, I have had the privilege of working with and, um, and I'm just sorry I can't be there to do this in person so we can all have a cocktail afterwards, but here we go. <laughs> So in speaking of flooding and historic buildings, I think it's probably a, um, a good idea just to have context. And a lot of these images are non-New Orleans images. This is not a New Orleans problem. This is a United States problem and an, a, to a large degree, a world problem. So if you think about historic communities and places you have visited across the United States, historic communities are generally located next to water. Why? Water is commerce transportation. Um, um, it provides a uh, food, obviously a liquid water. Um, so a lot of historic communities initially settled next to water and then generally kind of moved um, sort of um, inland from from whatever their principal water location was. This is this is Exeter, uh, New Hampshire, a waterway runs through it. Um, I came, went back actually last fall, this is the same place. They are managing their water. So managing water has some pluses and some minuses. So what we're going to do, and New Orleans is no stranger, stranger to that through the levee system. So what we're gonna do is look at what, what water means in terms of specifically flooding. As I said, New Orleans is no stranger to flooding. So, so several, um, Jack provided me several uh, photos of uh, flooding in the French Quarter. So I, I wanna sh give a shout out to Jack and give him credit for them. In many ways, I think probably everyone in New Orleans has a, a pair of rubber boots in, their, in the backseat of their car or in their trunk, just because you never know what day you'll run across an instance like this. Um, just to provide context, and you probably all know this, but this is um, the Vieux Carré Commission. So the Vieux Carré is part of a much larger city, um, um, uh, a lot of historic districts within the city of New Orleans. So it's representative of one of many. So to provide context, currently there are over 47,000 properties that are regulated through either the Vieux Carré Commission or the HDLC in the city of New Orleans. The green square is the Vieux Carré Commission. In looking at water historically in New Orleans, um, I tried to find a, a good um, comparative map. So if you look at the historic map on the left and at the top, you see uh, Lake Pontchartrain. If you, if you look carefully, you'll see um, sort of, uh, I'll say inlets and waterways that, that come down like fingers into what is now the city of New Orleans. If you look on the right, which is a 2006 version of a city map that's looking at the different districts, a lot of those fingers are gone. Doesn't mean that the water's not there. It means that it has been culverted, built over, managed in some way in an engineering fashion to allow we, the people, to live on this land. And every day or any day, the possibility of flooding exists. In spite of the fact that there are levees and pump stations, et cetera, that to a large part manage a lot of the water. So what kinds of flooding exist? One is persistent or, or what may be called high tide or nuisance flooding. So it has to do with moon phases. So if there's a full moon in, and you're on beaches, this is really typical of a lot of Atlantic coast flooding, you'll get, you'll get sort of water ponding on the roadways. This, by the way, when combined with a storm, so if you have a storm during a high tide, you get the cumulative effects of both the storm and the high tide. So a hurricane hitting the Northeast during a high, a high tide uh, uh, phase of the moon, like Hurricane Sandy, results in significantly more damage because the baseline of the water height in the high tide is higher. Coastal uh, flooding. So this is the typical hurricane tropical storm. And in the Northeast, something called a nor'easter where the water, where the storm kind of comes up the coast. Um, 
So coastal storms tend to be about water as in flooding, think bathtub, water rising, as well as velocity, so think waves, so higher waves, um, storm surge, in addition to high winds. So that combined effect is what a coastal storm is. So flooding is one component of a multi-layered um, event. In the Northeast, we also, or in the Northern portions of the country, we also get what's called ice jams. So you have waterways where you have sheets of ice that can back up under the abutments of bridges. And then because you get basically a wall of ice, everything behind it starts to flood. You can also um, inland get, get water rising because you get a lot of rain. So uh, uh, cre uh, ponds and, and lakes and things can flood because there's a huge rain event. River flooding, um, usually, usually precipitated by a lot of rain upstream or at the location can also cause flooding. This is actually where my office is in, in Maniunk, which is a mill section of the city. So if you look, the historic districts to the left, uh, highways to the right, and there's the river. So this is, this is half a block from my office, pay attention to the deck. This was August, same deck. So the water went up about 18 feet. I literally sat in my office and watched the flood gauge go up. And then I said, oh, time for a walk. Let me go take a picture. So this is the kind of sudden impact of a river flooding. Notice sky is blue, puffy clouds. It's lovely. The rain happened the day before. So one of the um, programs that the federal government put in place was the National Flood Insurance Program. Homeowners policies, as probably everyone in New Orleans knows, do not cover flooding. And they, they haven't covered flooding. Um, so in 1968, the federal government established the National Flood Insurance Program. And the National Flood Insurance Program provides a pool of money to be used across the country um, where everyone pays in a premium and then they, in the event of a flood, can, can draw down if they are participating in that and up to date with their premiums, can get money back to, to fix their property. And it also actually applies to um, contents as well. And it's different for residential properties versus commercial properties. So one of the things that the National Flood Insurance Program does is because they're paying out money based on a claims basis, they of course want to, to not lose a lot of money. It's supposed to be financially neutral, meaning the amount of money that comes in in premiums is supposed to be going out in claims. They're not supposed to um, uh, call up the federal government and say, we need more. That has not been happening. If you think about you know, Katrina, Harvey, Sandy, you can name all of the storms that have been happening and they're happening at a much faster pace there's a lot of drawdown going and not enough money coming in. And I'll get to that. So one of the things that the National Flood Insurance Program is doing is they are incentivizing communities to reduce flood risk. If they reduce flood risk, then they're paying less out in premiums. One of the other things they do is also, they produce what's called flood insurance rate maps, also known as firms. So firms actually describe the um, the possibility, or excuse me, the, the historic rate of flooding in a specific area. And I'll show you firms and I'll explain what that means in a moment. Historic properties, those built before the community adopted the firm are known as pre-firm. So most historic properties that haven't changed ownership are not required in many communities. And I didn't check New Orleans to actually have flood insurance. So what does a flood insurance rate map look like? This is a real fancy version and you can, you can download these online, although I will admit that FEMA's website was not um, very cooperative today, so I couldn't get a New Orleans version, but this is actually the state of Delaware. So this is the town of Lewis and everything that's blue is um, at risk for flooding. And this is based upon historical data. So what they do is they look over our past X number of years and say, based upon the number of times it has flooded over the last, and I don't know what the magic number is in terms of number of years, 
this place has at least a one in 100 chance of flooding. So all of the areas in blue have at least a one in 100 chance of flooding or 1% flood. It's also known as a special flood hazard area. So this is, I'm gonna try and keep technical words down to a minimal, minimum, excuse me. <clears throat> so flood insurance, the rate of your flood insurance is based upon the rate of risk of your property. So if you have a property that is a high risk, meaning it's geographically physically lower than its neighbor, the flood insurance will be higher. It's based on historical data. So what are, what are the storms that happened before this one or, or how many times in the past has this property flooded? And therefore, how likely is it to flood again? So what we, what we have commonly heard as the 100 year flood is not that it will flood every 100 years. It's really that within every year, it has a one in 100 chance of flooding based upon past historical data. So that's something that's known as a special flood hazard area. And then there are two different kinds of flooding, A zone and V zone. A zone, think bathtub, the water rises. So wherever you are, the water's going to rise um, as if it were in a bathtub. So it's fairly still water. Then there's something called V zone. V zone is actually velocity. So the water's moving. So think storm surge wave action. And the depth that are on the map, so if you look on this map, there's um, the one at the top, I don't know if you can see my cursor, the one at the top is a zone VE and it says eight feet. And this one is a zone AE and it says seven feet. So the VE is located along the beach. So that's the one that's going to get the velocity, the moving water. And that is eight feet um, uh, uh, below the datum. And the AE is bathtub and that's seven feet below the datum. So this, this, this um, line where this 1% um, flood line is, is known as the base flood elevation, BFE. So many communities recognize that, that building a little bit higher than what is known as the base flood elevation, BFE, is safer for its residents. So they actually recommend a design flood elevation, which is administered locally by the flood plain manager. And that could either, that's generally one to two feet above base flood. And that difference in height is known as freeboard. And it depends if you're in zone A or zone V as to how that's calculated, but I'll just leave it at that. So this is administered locally in the same way historic preservation is administered locally. So there's not a state rule that says you have to do something. Each community decides. But to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, you have to at least meet the minimum federal standards. So this is the flood insurance rate map for New, uh, New Orleans. Um, and I picked the French Quarter. And as you can see, there's this hatched line that runs across the city. So what the note up here says is area with reduced flood in, uh, risk due to levee. So because the levee is in place, the flood risk is lowered. So as we saw in the, those prior photos, it only means that it's lowered if the pumps work and the levee doesn't break. But then there was Katrina when the levee broke. So this shows areas that are as much as 10 feet of standing water during Katrina in the city of New Orleans. So um, as I said, um, those flood insurance rate map are based upon historical data. There are two things that are really impacting um, flood insurance, or excuse me, flood risk, and it's geographically based. So one of them is called sea level rise and the other is subsidence. So sea level rise is when the waterways literally rise up. And there's a lot of science behind it. I don't wanna argue it. I just wanna say, I believe it and I accept it. So the water levels are actually increasing for a number of reasons that are generally out of control of the people living in an area. <clears throat> 
The secondary um, um, possibility is also is what's called subsidence. The land is actually sinking. And subsidence generally occurs when uh, uh, the, the people who live in a region or an area extract um, stuff out of the ground. Stuff could be water, it could be minerals, it could be anything you're excavating down. And as the ground compacts down, the land literally drops. Because New Orleans was generally built on marshy, marshy land, it has been sinking. So the city itself has been dropping as the sea has been rising. So that combination is actually causing the height of the, the relative height of the water uh, to the relative height of the land, the water is rising faster. How much? Well, because New Orleans has a levee, I couldn't, I couldn't find obviously something that's directly impacting the city in terms of height. So I went to sealevelrise.org and looked at how much is water rising in, um, in a geographic area close to New Orleans. So what sea level rise.org estimates is that by 2050, between 20, excuse me, 2016 and 2050, so essentially 35 years, that the water height relative to the height of the land will rise 25 inches. 25 inches is two feet. That's huge. So what does it mean for historic properties? So this is an example of the Eastern Shore of Maryland. So the red squares are all historically designated properties and the boundary is the historic district. So on the left is the current um, aerial photograph with that information on it. And what is within what that, that special flood hazard area, 1% flood chance. So as the water rises, more and more properties are more impacted by flooding on the right. In fact, this article, this, this graphic really struck me. This was in the New York Times last June. So if you look at FEMA's maps, the official FEMA estimate of flood vulnerable properties is on the left. Independent researchers looked at what they saw as the real impact and came up with their own map. And it's on the right. Flooding is not a coastal problem. Problem. Flooding is just a problem. So the one thing flood insurance, and this is the one thing that really activates property owners to do things, um, uh, to uh, excuse me, or really impacts uh, property owners to do things, but also uh, marries that against historic preservation concerns. So as, as preservation advocates, which is I think what most of the people on the call are, we really have to start speaking the language of, of flooding to be able to um, um, participate in this conversation. FEMA is an 800 pound gorilla. They don't care about what your railing looks like. They just want you to be safe and be flood safe. So, one of the things that, that FEMA does is manage what's called the emergency management cycle. And this is their way of looking at flooding and the impacts on communities. So what, what we as preservationists have to do is take the, the, our goal of protecting the building and maintaining the um, integrity. So we're protecting it from flooding, we're maintaining historic integrity, and we have to basically balance those things together to achieve results that we can live with that are acceptable to our, our aesthetic concerns, but also provide that safe building that FEMA is going to require of us. So I have modified the, um, the FEMA um, emergency management cycle to really address historic um, properties and flooding. So if you could bear with me, what I'm gonna try and do is basically show from a policy point of view how preservationists can plug into FEMA system um, to be able to better uh, manage historic properties and have a voice in that process. So one of the things every community is required to do is do a hazard mitigation plan. 
In many more rural places, this happens at a county level, at a city the size of New Orleans, the city itself will take care of it. Your, your um, hazard mitigation plan is at this point, or excuse me, right now it's under final review. Every five years, this document has to be updated. Um, and that's a requirement of participating in FEMA's flood insurance uh, program. So the National Flood Insurance Program. So yours is just at the end of its public comment period. But during a public comment period, citizens, groups, et cetera, can voice concerns for historic properties. They, they are required to have public meetings. So getting involved in that process is actually a way to have a voice. And yes, this just ended, but this is gonna be published again in five years. What, the other thing is to develop a time frame for planning. So as I showed you on that, um, the chart from sealevelrise.org, the water is growing higher and higher. And as we're thinking about how we are mitigating properties, mitigation being, um, how are we going to, oh, I'm sorry. Um, how are we going to um, improve a property's flood resilience? You have to know how long you're planning for. So for example, if I have a house and I wanna live in it the next 50 years, the graphic I showed you showed you, uh, indicated that within 35 years, the sea level was gonna rise um, two feet. So if I wanna be there for 50 years, and maybe I have to be able to elevate my property three feet. So you have to have a sense of how long you're planning for. So this, this graphic I love because it's so clear. Um, so this is from sea level uh, rise.org. In Delaware, it's showing that six inches of sea level rise in 35 years. They expect the same six inches in the next 14 years. <clears throat> Identify historic properties. In many ways, New Orleans is really ahead of the game. I mean, you've, you have 47,000 <laughs> designated historic properties. So I think that's pretty clear. You have to be able to assess your flood risk. So um, I looked at, uh, this was from um, NOAA, the National um, Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. And this is another kind of a map viewer. So if you look on the bottom left, this is just mean high, high water. And this is just more terminology than you need to know. But if the, if the water level goes up by one foot, look at the difference in terms of what it means um, in terms of flooding. So there are sites available that are predictive sites, meaning you can see what sea level rise actually means um, in, in, your own, in your own location. So using national um, resources like NOAA are, are a good example of that. Um, you have to also establish preservation priorities. One of the things that you have to keep in mind is you're not gonna save everything. Um, and certainly properties that are um, in poor physical shape or bad candidates for flood resilience. And you have to look at, at mitigation options that are not just on the building. In many ways, um, if you've heard of LEAD, um, leadership in engineering and, oh my goodness, I forgot the, my acronym, um, but there's green building technology. A lot of it is about managing water. And that's one of the things, or one of the ways that you can improve flood resilience. So having things like per, per, permeable paving where the stormwater gets absorbed into the ground is one of those things that are pre preservation friendly um, option. They don't hurt the building and, and it's pretty innocuous on the site. And you can also participate in the community rating system. So I will say that New Orleans actually participates in the rating system community rating system. They have a score of what's um, eight. And what, what the score of eight does, it is any property that is in a special flood hazard area is entitled to a 10% discount in their flood insurance. Since every property that's basically protected by the levy is not in a designated special flood hazard area, it gives you a 5% discount. Across the, uh, the lake, uh, Mandeville has a rating of six which is a 20% discount um, or a 10% discount for, for non, uh, for properties outside of the special flood hazard area. And St. Augustine, I'm gonna give a shout out to because one of my um, colleagues from St. Augustine is on the phone and I'm working with them now. 
they have a rating of five. So they get a 25% discount um, and a 10% discount for those properties that are not in a special flood hazard area. The ratings are great, but I will also issue a word of caution with them. With a better score, which is a lower number in the rating system, that doesn't make any sense to me, but with a, with a better score, it generally means that the community has to have um, an increasingly higher standard of flood resi resilience for their community, which means that it usually impacts historic properties more. So you have to be careful about that. Yes, there's a benefit for insurance reduction, rate reduction, but that generally means that you have to accept um, a greater impact or greater compliance for all properties, including historic properties with local regulations. <clears throat> and the last, um, one of the last things you can do um, as part of a mitigation strategy or a preparing strategy is actually give real information to property owners that's usable. Um, so unfortunately, flood language is extraordinarily complicated. Most people don't understand it and they're not going to take the time to read it. But to, to be able to translate this into something that people could actually use um, is helpful. And from a preservation point of view, you know, and as the author of your guidelines, I feel like giving people something that is in a, in a user-friendly way actually is really helpful for everybody in terms of moving forward. So response and recovery. So response and recovery pretty much meld together. There's, there's not a lot of preservation that occurs in response and recovery. It's really about life safety, getting people out of harm's way. So um, in the immediate aftermath and before you really start rebuilding, it's really, um, you know, how can we keep people safe and how can we minimize um, additional damage? <clears throat> so this is a New Jersey uh, photo post Sandy. So the water literally just, and um, the wave action just ripped off the left side of the house. So I don't know if um, um, you heard of this example, but there's a, there's a town in, or a city in Maryland called Ellicott City. And I was describing that the, the flood levels are based upon the special flood hazard area, which is the one in 100 uh, chance or 1% chance of flooding in any given year. This was a thousand year flood that happened in 2016. It also happened in 2018. So within two years, they got two 1000 year floods, which is incredible. So it devastated their main street, you know, knocked um, commerce out, of course, across all of main street and it killed somebody. And what, one of the things that they did was had to make hard choices about, do we save every building on the street because it's, because it's historic or do we give a place back to the water to go? They have since demolished some of their historic buildings to give back a place to the water. So mitigation is where a lot of the physical bricks and mortar portions of flood resilience come in. So, Mitigation really means reduce harm. It's not about guaranteeing that it's all going to be fixed and guaranteeing it's all going to be, you know, work out fine. What you're doing is really looking at ways of reducing harm. And in thinking about mitigation, don't think about a one size fits all approach. This is generally a layer cake. The more, the, the, the more strategies you can layer on top of each other, the better chance you have of successfully mitigating a significant flood event. So when, when thinking about mitigation from a preservation perspective, um, there are a lot of different um, pieces you wanna consider. So there are those, consider, those, those things that are community-wide things like putting levees in, which help the entire city. And then there are gonna be those things that are really done at the property level. Those things that are community-wide generally take a lot of planning, a lot of money, and a lot of focus. Property actions are things that individual homeowners will, or property owners will wanna do. So safety, safety, safety. The flood um, 
um, the flood, the FEMA and all the people who are dealing with flood and floodplain management are really looking at people first, buildings next, preservation is somewhere down the line and I would hate to think about where it, where it sits in the sequence, but that's not their focus. So we have to play in their sandbox and we have to be able to talk their language. So safety, safety, safety is the first thing that they're going to talk about. So as I said, there are community-wide strategies as well as uh, building specific strategies. When you're thinking about these, you really have to think about how long am I planning for? Am I planning for two feet of water to go up? Am I planning for three feet? What's the, what's the appropriate um, timeline for planning? Community-wide strategies have the greater benefit of they can protect a lot of properties all at once. The levy, the levy system in New Orleans is fantastic, a uh, fantastic example of that. Property strategies are generally geared towards protecting an individual's property. So, so those, um, particularly those neighborhoods where people don't have the means to improve their properties will remain the most vulnerable. So in looking at the different strategies, a lot of um, the community-wide strategies are um, sort of think big infrastructure projects. So on a shoreline, there are both structural and non-structural. So I mentioned St. Augustine, this is St. Augustine. So they have a seawall running along that waterway. Uh, bulkheads, riprap, Flood barriers, this is actually um, the uh, Potomac. Floodgates, this is Rotterdam. Um, offshore, you can have breakwaters and what breakwaters do is they keep the waves, they, they reduce the velocity of the waves as they come into shore. So they don't have as much um, 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 force as they hit buildings, et cetera. I'm sorry, I'm admitting people, pardon me. <laughs> Um, jetties actually um, um, provide a, a kind of calm water where you have a, um, um, a place where you can dock boats, for example. Um, you can also do natural wetland or excuse me, natural shoreline protection. So it can be reestablishing wetlands. This is actually in New Jersey and they put a boardwalk through and made it a board, uh, bird sanctuary so you can go for a walk. And actually doing those dual mitigation strategies is a, something to really think about because you make amenities out of flood mitigation strategies. This is a, a, um, re a restoration of the floodplain. Um, in beaches, you can reestablish the dunes and particularly if you plant um, uh, dune grasses on them, it will stabilize them so they don't just blow away. Um, you can also nourish the beaches with really wide beaches, typical of some of the North eastern part of the United States, the wide breach beaches actually um, serve to slow down the waves as they're coming on land. Um, along roadways, you can use um, drainage ditches, both engineered and not, um, to the extent that you can get the, the ground, or excuse me, the stormwater to actually percolate down into the ground. That's actually the best option. If you have a storm water management system that doesn't percolate down, you have to make sure it's clear. Pumping stations are something you guys are really familiar with. They have to turn on at the right times to, to be valuable and be working. Um, another option is actually to, to, uh, to make fake lakes, basically, where you're, uh, they're called retention ponds, where you're storing the water and actually allowing it to absorb into the earth. Levees and berms can be both natural as well as made of concrete and other similar kinds of materials. Um, swales in the landscape are these basically drainage ditches built into the landscape and when it's wet, it can be filled with water, but then it can you know, obviously dry out once the water is absorbed. <clears throat> One of the problems that we've had across the country is that we have, I will say, overbuilt on our land and particularly in communities where they don't have um, strong zoning, they allow um, the property owners to build out most of their land and find no place for water to absorb. So um, reducing impervious surface coverage, the amount of a parcel 
on a parcel by parcel basis that people can actually build on or put driveways on or cover with patios and things is actually a way to help stormwater get absorbed into the um, ground and, and reduce the overall propensity for flooding in a community. Using native, native plants and rain gardens, so ways of capturing um, stormwater, this, this happens to be along a parking area. Um, you can also do building code improvements, and this is particularly um, looking at things like heavy storms um, where you have heavy winds or along coastal situations where you have velocity or river situations where you have velocity water. Um, um, and then there's transportation infrastructure. You know, how, how can you keep a, a roadway open? It's not just about whether or not I can get to the grocery store, it's whether or not I can get out of town at the time, you know, the flood happens. Bridges present another problem. So in addition to the ice, um, that I showed you earlier, if you get debris backing up under a bridge, it can also back up and cause flooding. So um, historic bridges, unfortunately, have shorter spans, more frequent abutments, but those can become a problem um, in terms of encouraging flooding further upstream. Um, causeways, the road to everywhere and nowhere. So this is actually on the eastern shore of Maryland. And the island, uh, uh, many of the islands on the uh, and other ends of those causeways, if those causeways go underwater once every time the full moon happens and the kids can't go to school and you can't go to work, and then it happens more and more frequently, it eventually leads to the abandonment of those places um, because life, life can't you know, happen if you can't get out of town or can't get off the island. Managing stormwater, you know, systems as a general rule, many stormwater systems, you know, are, are in the U.S. are over 100 years old, um, haven't been replaced, so they're failing, and then they haven't um, been um, increased to meet the new capacities as we're adding more residents to our cities. Um, some of the things that we basically need for living in any place are fresh water, sewage, and electricity. So these are the, the real basic utilities of life. Um, and if you can imagine not having any one of those things and how you would survive. So if you look at a community and look at where is your fresh water supply, where is your sewage treatment plant, where is your electrical plant, um, and how is that routed to the place that you need it to be? And is any, and is any place along that chain vulnerable? And a lot of communities are struggling because they're realizing they built their sewage treatment facility in a place at the edge of town because no one wanted to live there. Well, that's the place that's most vulnerable to flooding. So now what? And it's huge infrastructure costs for the city to improve that circumstance. So in terms of building mitigation, as I mentioned, the, um, well, there's different guidance out there. So the National Flood Insurance Program has issued, FEMA issues these um, uh, guidelines and books for different things that they do have one that is specifically addressing historic structures. So what pre-BW12 means, which is my notation, is that that guidance was issued pre Biggert Waters uh, 12, 2012. So that's before the Biggert Waters Act of 2012. So one of the things that you have to be careful with as you're going to, through FEMA's guidance is understanding the rules that have come in afterwards. So Bigot Waters 12 is only significant in that it, it states that uh, the National Flood Insurance Program must be self-supported um, as of 2012. So what that means is that flood insurance rates have been going up significantly. And anything in that document that applies to those rates is actually inaccurate. But that, that document is still on FEMA's website. So um, we are also in 2019, the National Park Service issued guidelines on flood ad adaptation. So that's a document that's out there. Currently, it's only available without pictures. Um, this spring, they will be reissuing the document, the guidelines to include pictures. <laughs> 
<clears throat> building elevation is another is another issue. There are many um, examples of elevations in New Orleans and elevations have historically been used in New Orleans. This example is not from New Orleans. The house on the right is a lovely historic house, but even in, if you think about the districts, the 47,000 properties, the house on the right is not flood insurance compliant. The, the two houses on the left are. So even as you're thinking about what it means to um, change existing historic properties, you also have to think about what it means to have an undeveloped piece of land adjacent to historic properties and understand that any new property or new house that gets built in that location has to be compliant and what that will do and how that will impact the historic character of the surrounding neighborhood. And building elevation is, um, as I said, something that you're used to, but we're gonna cover the specific um, elements of building elevation in the second session. I just wanted to acknowledge it's out there as we will building relocation and the park service has a lot of guidance around what that means. So I'm not going to get into it right now. And also acquisition and demolition. As I mentioned in, in the Ellicott City example, they chose to remove some of those historic buildings along Main Street to provide a place for the water. This was Main Street of this town. And all of these, all of these, uh, what were commercial buildings got de uh, demolished when the creek, which is just where the tree line is to on the edge here, when the creek overflowed about 20 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, they had to demo all of the uh, buildings because they were so badly damaged. And at this point, this town has no main street. Um, so Adaptation. So one of the things, and, and um, this gets back to the boots in the back of the car, the rain boots in the back of the car, is we over time start to adapt to, to flooding. So our first instinct might be to uh, not drive down a road when it's flooded or not park in an area where it's flooded or you know pull out the, the, the boots when we try to cross the parking lot when we realize you know we have to get from point A to point B. There is the possibility of also allowing a building to flood. That's an adaptation. So if you, if you set the building up and you say, okay, I understand that this is in a vulnerable location and what does that mean? Each one of the white bricks on the left-hand side on the left-hand image is marking the height of the water. So this is actually a park service site. So the building's on the right and the white bricks are right along here. So this is marking the heights of different floods that have occurred on this building. So what the Park Service decided to do is say, okay, first floor floods, we know it's gonna flood. And what does that mean? We put our offices upstairs and everything that goes in the downstairs, we are gonna, we're gonna design it in such a way that we hose it down and move on. And this is an adaptation in terms of how the building gets used. It's not something that everyone can do and it doesn't make sense for a lot of places, but you have to start thinking about that if you wanna keep historic buildings where they are. In all this conversation, the things I haven't mentioned and I don't, and I'm not um, an expert in them is that flooding actually also has a significant impact on the landscape. And if you think about the landscape, don't take it as just the trees, think about the farmers and all the people who live off the land. It also has a significant impact on archeological uh, resources. So a lot of archeological resources are actually threatened by uh, flooding, particularly along coastlines where they're also getting waves coming in. And you know, at some point in some places, you have to make, start making the decision that maybe it's not really good to live here anymore. And it may not be a New Orleans specific problem, but if you, if you recall back to those flood maps where we, with one foot of water outside of the levees, you know, places were gone <laughs> in terms of the map. Um, as those places start to disappear, do we have a responsibility to document them and the people, the communities who are there before they are gone? And that's a question. Um, and I think that's a question that as preservation 
minded folks and advocates, we have to really start asking the larger question of, is it really about the building or is it about the people and the community that, that exists? Because at some point we're gonna have to accept it's no longer there. This is Eastern Shore, Maryland, um, one of the islands, and this is literally the last house, house standing. It is no longer standing. But in many cases, this is the reality of where flooding is going. Um, and how are we going to mark that history? And I managed to do that in under an hour, so I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> I have a question. If interacting, um, you said that FEMA incentivizes communities that enact certain flood mitigation problems or whatever for their community. Um, we have a situation in New Orleans where ever since they put in the streetcar on North Rampart, we now have flooding we had asked, we were afraid that part of the permeable neutral ground was being removed with the track placement and whatnot. And they said that it shouldn't, it should, the absorption rate should be the same. They, you know, it wouldn't be a problem, but they did not increase the size of the vaults that collect the water from the storm drains. And not only that, they bermed the French Quarter off from the direction from the natural flow to the pumping stations by raising the level, the elevation of the cross streets to North Rampart so that whenever we have heavy rains now, it floods up three blocks and you can see cars are passing on the Treme side of North Rampart, but there's no vehicles that can pass on the French Quarter side of the French Quarter uh, of North Rampart. So I was wondering what steps can we take, if any, to address this problem? Um, so I'm an architect, I'm not a hydrologist, I am not a geologist, <laughs> I am not a land surveyor, I'm not a lot of things. And I clearly haven't seen this, this issue since I'm, I don't have the privilege of being able to go to New Orleans. So one of the, one of the um, a few things I would suggest is, is certainly make your floodplain manager aware. Um, um, whoever is the um, uh, city's floodplain manager should be made aware as to what is happening if, and if they're not aware. Um, you can also participate, as I suggested, in the, in the next round of the um, hazard mitigation plan update. What your goal is in the, in the hazard mitigation planning process is not just to go to endless boring meetings, but what you want to do is make sure that the recommendations in that hazard mitigation plan include things that specifically address historic properties. And here's why it's important, and this is really critical. If something happens or there's an opportunity to get money out of FEMA or some similar organization, if there is not a written recommendation that goes to a, a preservation friendly incentive, they will not get funded. So if there's a written recommendation to you know, protect the, and I'm making this up, I don't know your situation, but if there's a written recommendation to prevent water from backing up into the French Quarter from the, the streetcar, then that could be something that if, if that's prioritized in the FEMA allocation of funding, then that's something that could in fact be rectified. Thank you. For Any other questions? It's all too clear, it's all too depressing, which is 
So the next session, if there are no more questions, so the next session is in two weeks and I don't have a calendar in front of me, so I'll rely on Brooke to provide that information. And what I'm really gonna focus on in the next session is really what you can do for buildings that are typical in the, in, you know, the French Quarter and in New Orleans as a whole. So what are the physical changes you can do at individual properties? And there'll be a differentiation between commercial and residential and um, also some of those strategies will work better for wood frame buildings where others might work better for um, masonry or, or stucco buildings. So we'll, we'll be able to look at those individual property level changes then and, and have a conversation about what are the preservation impacts of some of those changes and how do you, from a regulatory standpoint, how do you manage those? Um, and how do you sort of navigate how high do we raise a building, for example? And what do we do with that foundation once we're seeing more of it? Thank you so much, Dominique. The next session is Wednesday, February 3rd, same time, same, almost same place. We'll send a new link. <laughs> uh, Dominique, uh, <clears throat> can I ask you one question? It might come in the next session. Um, through time in the French Quarter, the level of the dirt keeps rising. You know, the, build, uh, the buildings aren't necessarily subsiding, but the grade keeps getting built up. Every time they repave the street, it gets higher and higher. So the curb gets disappeared. And so what, what's, what's the solution, or not the solution, but how does, how does that get handled? Well, you're, I, I would suggest you're, you're dealing with two things, and this is true of everywhere. So as, as we as human beings, I'll say, um, add layers to our, our ground, be it, you right. know, paved roadways and sidewalks, et cetera, the grade outside of our buildings does keep going up. Um, I'm doing a project right now in San Antonio, and we found that the grade had gone up as much as 18 inches. So on the outside of the building, so the building looks really short now. Um, so that's a, that's an issue we're dealing with. Um, and I know that one firsthand, but also if the ground itself is sinking, you know, if you think about the, the height of your sidewalk is relatively going up to the height of your house. So your house or your foundation or your crawl space under your house is lower than the sidewalk. So that becomes like a little mini bathtub, right? So that's getting worse and right. worse. Right. <laughs> so so, you know, is it a question of stepping back as a community and saying, wait a second, you know, maybe it's not just adding another layer of roofing, so to speak, or another layer of sidewalk. Maybe we have to actually take this down. And, and that's a huge community-wide expense um, and, and solution. Miami wow. Beach, Miami Beach, for example, literally made the choice to raise the heights of all its roadways and sidewalks above the flood zone and leave the, ba the buildings low with the hopes that the property owners would ra raise the buildings. So think about it. So the, the streets are two to three feet higher than the buildings. So they created wow. little bathrooms <clears throat> around all of these buildings. So each, each city and each um, community is choosing their, their best way to solve the problem. Miami Beach has a huge amount of money and they have property owners with the means to literally raise their buildings if they choose to. Um, and, and it's such a, you know, because they can generate so much cash, that makes sense. That doesn't make sense in a lot of places. And the right. city of Galveston after, I think it's hurricane, I think it was Ike, I want to say, in about 1900, um, literally raised their, this is, so the Miami Beach solution was based upon the city of Galveston solution, Galveston, Texas, and they literally raised the height of the sidewalk, I think it was something like 13 feet. Huge. Right, yeah, yeah I've read about that. <laughs> um, and people raised the buildings. And Galveston's lovely, but now Galveston's still threatened. Or threatened again. So there's no, there is no magic answer to this. Okay. Everyone should just have a really good, you know, glass of wine tonight and get over it. <laughs> no, it's just, un unfortunately, unfortunately, there is no, um, part of the, the, the hardest reality of, of dealing with flooding for me as an architect is architects solve problems. This is not a problem I can solve. 
what the biggest thing I can do is give people information to help them make better choices. So um, that's, that's kind of the way I'm approaching it. But getting involved in the conversation from the perspective of the floodplain manager in your community, in your city, is the best thing you can do to have a voice in this process. They are not thinking about you. If you think back to the days of ADA when everyone was slapping ramps on historic buildings and we were all horrified, you know, we figured out you can design a decent ramp and get people in a building, but it took a while. So let's not let the flood people <laughs> run over the preservation people um, without having a voice. So learn to speak their language. Okay, thank you. Certainly. If that's all, then we're gonna let Dominique get back to her evening. Well, thank you all for joining and I hope to see you again in two weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night.